Hello, this is CHM 301, Atomic and Molecular Structure and Bonding, Lecture 4. I'm Dr. Andrew Tehemi Kiowa, Electrophysical Chemistry in the Department of Chemistry, Benue State University, Makurdi, Nigeria. This lecture is meant for my third year chemistry students as well as other students worldwide who are interested in this lecture. Today's lecture is about further applications of the Schrodinger equation. Uh, in particular, we are going to look at particle in a box of finite depth. Uh, under that, we'll look at tunneling, consequences of tunneling. Then we are going to move on to a molecular motion. And that is application of the Schrodinger equation to molecular motion. We are going to look at vibration and rotation. So after the lecture, I expect students to be able to write and manipulate the Schrodinger equation for a particle in a box of finite depth. I expect students to be able to describe the phenomena of tunneling in quantum mechanics. I also expect them to be able to apply quantum mechanics to molecular motion, like vibration and rotation. So here is a box with a particle. This red circle represents a particle. And the potential energy of this particle is V. Total energy of the system is E. And the box has dimension a negative A all over 2 uh, to A all over 2. Um, and all of this represents x. So at this point, x is equal to negative a all over 2. At this point, x is equal to a all over 2. So why are we interested in finding the energy? Or why are we interested in studying a box of finite depth? Bearing in mind that we did that for a box of infinite depth, one dimension, two dimension, and three dimensions. <laughs> it is because in a real world, things have finite dimension. So for the particle in a box model or question to work in a real world, it must have a finite dimension, otherwise we won't be able to apply it. So for such a box, the potential energy obeys the following conditions. That is, in the box, potential energy is zero. And outside the box, the potential energy is V. So because the potential energy is zero inside the box, we can write the Schrodinger equation in terms of this as in equation two. And this equation is very similar to what we had when we were considering um, a particle in a box of infinite wall. Therefore, the wave function is going to be the same as that of a box of infinite wall. So this is the wave function that will satisfy this Schrodinger equation, equation two. When this equation is substituted into the Schrodinger equation and solved for the corresponding eigenvalues, which are the energy values, we obtain an equation of this form, where A um, is a constant um, representing the length of the box n is a quantum number h is Planck's constant and m is the mass of the particle so the solution uh, gives these various energy values for the corresponding quantum numbers n and these solutions oscillate as you can see within the box so Inside the box, the potential energy is 
uh, less than the total energy. And the solution of the wave function oscillate within the box. Outside the box, the potential energy is greater than the total energy. And the wave functions decay rather slowly with distance away from the box. So outside the box, the Schrodinger equation takes this form, equation 3. And the equation, wave function that will satisfy the Schrodinger equation, equation 3, is given by equation 4. This is for outside the box, right hand side, and this is for outside the box, left hand side. A K is a constant and it has this expression. On the basis of this wave function, the energy uh, levels or the corresponding energies of the particle can be solved for the case of particle being outside the box. For any values of MA and the potential energy B. So tunneling through a barrier, let's assume that the particle has a potential energy that does not rise to infinity when it is in the walls of the box. Uh, this shaded part represents the thickness of the walls of the box. So if the particle is within this space or there, potential energy doesn't rise to zero. It's not zero, so to say, and it doesn't rise to infinity. Plus, the potential energy is greater than the total energy of the system. Also, if the wall is very thin, then something interesting is going to happen. The wave function is going to oscillate in the box and then very smoothly um, in the region representing the walls of the box. That is, there is oscillation in the box and then the wave function decays exponentially within the walls of the box and then oscillates outside the box again. Uh, what this simply means is that if we project the particle from region 1, it's going to propagate itself or move to the barrier which represents the walls of the box and its wave function is going to decay rather exponentially and then oscillate outside of it again. So, within the region where the potential energy is greater than the total energy, there is a slow decay of the wave function. Now, because we find the wave function oscillating in region 1 and in region 2, we can say that the chances of the particle existing in these two regions is very high. That is, the particle um, can found here and then across the walls of the box, the barrier, and this is against the, the principle of classical metrics that the particle can only exist in region 1. So the existence of a particle in a classically forbidden region is what is known as tunneling. And it's a consequence of the wave character of matter. So the Schrodinger equation uh, for this case, let's say, uh, in the region where the potential energy is a constant V and greater than the total energy of the system is given by equation 5. The equation satisfying equation 5 is equation 7. So if we substitute equation 7 in here and differentiate it twice, we are going to get k squared. We substitute k squared and uh, make k the subject of the formula to allow us to find what the value of k is. 
And that gives equation 9 as the value of k. So, because positive and negative values of k are possible, we're going to have a wave function that has both positive and negative values of k. So, the appropriate wave function is given by equation 10. What happens is the exponential term in this equation goes to infinity as x goes to infinity. That is the first term. And the second term goes to infinity as x goes to negative infinity. What that simply means is that the wave function cannot satisfy the boundary condition all over the region of space. So let's take uh, the case where there is a potential barrier. This is a barrier, um, the shaded point or path rather. And at this point, the total energy is less than the potential energy. And outside this region, that's outside region three, that is in the box and outside the box, the potential energy is zero. Let's suppose that the particle is projected from region one. Then it's going to progress. It will encounter the barrier and the wave function is going to decay slowly and then oscillate outside the barrier again. So to sort of model this, the second part of the wave function, which represents a case where there is an exponential um, decay of the wave function can be adopted. So the small oscillation in region two corresponds to a situation whereby there is a small probability of the particle existing in region three, uh, region two rather. So how do we obtain this probability? We obtain it by matching, match the values of the wave function and its differential at point x equal to zero and point x equal to d. A rough approximation to this works when b is equal to one. And then we find value of the wave function at x equal to d. So this probability is obtained by squaring um, in accordance uh, with Bond's interpretation and given equation 13, where p is the probability, and this expression represents the probability in this case, k is equal to this. Uh, where E is the total energy, B is the potential energy, D is the thickness of the barrier, M is the mass of the particle, and H bar is equal to Planck's constant all over 2 pi. So equation 13 says tunneling probability decreases sharply with the width of the barrier, the mass of the particle and the energy uh, deficit uh, compared to the value required for a classical particle to pass through the barrier. So this is the wave function, the one in red of the heavy particle, and this is the wave function of the light particle. You observe that the wave function of a heavy particle decays completely in the barrier why that of the part, the light particle rather decays um, uh, smoothly and doesn't vanish in the barrier and re-emerges outside the barrier again. That is to say, heavy particles have less tendency to tunnel than light particles. So here are some of the consequences or ramifications of tunneling. 
Um, certain reactions depend on isotopes, and this is because of the ability of the proton to tunnel more rapidly than the deuteron. Um, again, reactions that involve proton attain equilibrium very quickly compared to other reactions. And this is because the proton tunnels more rapidly than any other species of ions. As a result, the proton tunnels uh, quickly from the acid to the base. And this is an important feature of um, some enzyme catalyzed reactions. Electron tunneling is also responsible for the rate of electron transfer reactions at electrodes and in biological systems. Uh, when two wires are brought together, uh, wires are normally coated with thin films of insulators, are basically oxides. So direct contact within, between them is, is rather impossible. So when they are brought very close together, because of the ability of the electron to tunnel uh, through a barrier very quickly, the tunnel through the barrier, the, the thin film caught in the wires, and you see something like it's part as though the wires are touching, or in the actual sense they're not touching. Um, electron tunneling is also the principle upon which scanning tunneling microscope uh, works. And this technique is very important in uh, studying surfaces. Next, we apply quantum mechanics to molecular motion. And there are three types of motion. Uh, there is translational motion, vibrational motion, and rotational motion. Uh, for atoms, they undergo only translational motion. For molecules, undergo all the three types of motion. So we begin with vibrational motion. So we say an atom has undergone vibrational motion when uh, there is a displacement of atoms from their equilibrium position. Actually, energy is required for vibration to take place. So let's take this to be a cartoon of a molecule. Um, the spring, this one represents the bond, chemical bond. And X represents the bond length. So as the thermal energy increases, the vibration or amplitude increases as well. Vibration is studied in quantum mechanics in the framework of a harmonic oscillator. A harmonic oscillator mm -hmm. is just a model that enables the study of vibration motion in molecules. So a particle is said to undergo vibration, um, or rather harmonic oscillation, when the restoring force is proportional to the displacement of the molecules. So if we write F to be equal to negative A times X, where A is the force constant, X is the displacement, then um, we can write that the frequency of oscillation is equal to omega divided by 2 pi, which is equal to 1 all over 2 pi, uh, square root of A all over M, where M is the mass. And of course, omega is this. So the potential energy of the system depends on the distance between the atoms. And what we will know is that for many molecules, only the first two vibrational levels are occupied. So we can truncate the long uh, potential energy expression to the first two terms, or rather even the first term. This can be approximated to uh, V of X equal to half a x squared, where this represents the potential energy. 
If we make a plot of potential energy against X, we obtain this curve. The red one represents the equilibrium state, and then the green one represents um, a more realistic situation. And for large values of X, there is a dissociation of the molecule. Now, the narrowness of this curve depends on the magnitude of the force constant. The larger the A, the more narrow the well, and vice versa. So, to study vibration, we have two masses, this way and that way. Which one do we go for? To solve this problem, we use the reduced mass rather than the masses of the individual molecules. So, to obtain reduced mass, we take the product of the two masses and divide it by their mass, the sum of their masses. So that the Schrodinger equation becomes equation 18. Um, this is the reduced mass, and these are the corresponding wave functions, and this is the potential energy, and these are the various energy eigenvalues. There are sets of wave functions that satisfy equation 18. And this leads to the values, energy values or energy um, levels of vibration. These wave functions in mathematics are obtained by the normalized wave function, uh, which has this form um, n of n times h of n times beta times x and of course this is a function of beta x uh, exponential negative beta squared x squared all over 2 and this wave function has the shape of a Gaussian function uh, n sub n is a normalized constant h sub n is a constant uh, which is a combination of other constants and this is actually a Hermite polynomial. And beta is a constant with this um, expression. And sub so n is also a constant and it has this expression. So this is a table showing the Hermite polynomials. For n equal to 0, we have h sub so n to be 1. n equal to 1, we have 2z and so on to the n. So what are the properties of these Hermite polynomials? There are plenty of them, but those ones that apply in quantum mechanics are four or so. First one is differential equation. If we take the second derivative of a Hermite polynomial, take the difference of the product of two and z, and the first derivative of the polynomial plus 2n times the Hermite polynomial itself gives zero. The second one is the recursion relation. The Hermite polynomial at any point plus one is equal to 2z of the polynomial we started with minus 2n and h times h rather sub n minus 1 of the polynomial. Orthogonality. If we integrate from negative infinity to positive infinity of two different Hermite polynomials, put their products together times the exponential, the power of z squared uh, with respect to um, z gives zero and the two Hermite polynomials must not be the same. Yeah, before we move on, let us look at some properties of Hermite polynomials. There are plenty of them, but those ones that apply to quantum mechanics are basically four. First one is differential equation. The second derivative of the Hermite polynomial minus 2z 
of course you know z is beta x times the first derivative plus 2n times the Hamite polynomial itself is equal to 0. A recursion relation. If we add 1 to the Hamite polynomial, then what we have done, we obtain another polynomial, which is 2z, 8 sub n, which is the Hamite polynomial starting with, minus 2n times 8 sub n minus 1. The third is orthogonality. If we integrate from negative infinity to positive infinity of two separate Hamite polynomials with respect to z, we obtain 0, where n and n prime are not equal. The fourth is normalization. If we integrate from negative infinity to positive infinity, the square of the Hamite polynomial with respect to z, we obtain a constant this form. So these are the first few solutions of the Schrodinger equation uh, for the various wave functions. Psi of 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. And these are the corresponding expressions. So psi of 0, 2, 4 are all even functions for which psi of x is equal to psi of negative x. And the odd functions, psi of 1, 3, 5 are odd functions for which psi of x is equal to negative psi of negative x. If we apply the boundary condition that the oscillator will not exist at large compressions and or large extensions, then we obtain solutions for which the allowed states are those for which psi of x is equal to zero where x is plus or minus infinity and the permitted energy levels um, are given by equation 29. So these are the energy levels of the harmonic oscillator and we can see these are vibrational energy levels and this is the uh, angular frequency and these are quantum numbers beginning from zero. Um, this is the frequency and if we take the difference between two energy levels then we obtain h bar times the angular frequency and you know that h bar is h the Planck's constant divided by 2 pi so the energy levels from a ladder sort of with each spacing h bar times omega and this spacing is very small for big objects and very important for microscopic um, objects like uh, molecules so if we substitute zero into this expression we are going to have an energy level, energy value, half h bar times omega. That is to say that even at the lowest point, the harmonic oscillator has an energy value. And this lowest energy is called the zero point energy of the oscillator. So what are the properties of this harmonic oscillator? Firstly, the mean displacement is equal to zero, and the mean square displacement has this expression. Secondly, the mean potential energy of an oscillator, and that is the expectation uh, value uh, of this, is equal to this expression. 
and this can be reduced to this, which actually represents um, half times the energy levels of the oscillator. Now, because the total energy is the sum of the potential and the kinetic energies, the mean kinetic energy of an oscillator is given by this expression, which is 1 all over 2 uh, E of the energy values. And this is called the barrier theorem. Yeah, so let us move on to rotational motion. Rotational motion can be treated in two ways. Rotation in two dimensions and rotation in three dimensions. So we we'll begin with rotation in two dimensions. That is for the case of a particle on the ring. Let us consider a particle on the ring. Uh, this is the ring, the circular path. This is the particle, it has mass m. And this is the radius of the uh, particle given by the position uh, vector r. And this is the linear momentum of the particle. Um, this is direction in the z-axis, x-axis, and y-axis. The angular momentum of the particle is given by the ve vector j. And this vector is non-zero in the perpendicular direction. And it's a product of the linear um, momentum and the radius of the particle. Or we say the, not the radius of the particle, so to say the radius of the circular path produced by the particle, or rather the radius of the ring. So the total energy of the particle, um, if we call that E, is the sum of the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. And because the particle is moving in a circular path, its uh, position, which is R, is going to stay the same. So the, uh, um, the potential energy, which has to do with position of the particle, is going to be zero. So if we substitute zero here, we're going to end up with total energy of the particle being equal to um, p squared all over 2n, where p is the linear momentum and m is the mass of the particle. According to classical mechanics, the, the vertical uh, component of the particle given by vector j is the product of the linear momentum of the particle and the radius of the circular path are created by the particle, or rather, the radius of the ring. So, if we if we substitute, if we make p the subject of the formula and substitute it into this uh, expression, we get this as the energy um, of the particle. I is called the moment of inertia and is the product of the mass of the particle and square of um, its radius, uh, the, uh, the square of uh, its position, that is the radius of the ring. So not all values of the angular momentum are allowed in quantum mechanics. And that is to say that both the angular momentum and rotational energies are quantized. According to de Broglie, the relationship between the momentum and the wavelength of the particle is given by this. The angular momentum about the vertical uh, axis, which is the z uh, axis, is given by this. And this relationship shows that the shorter the wavelength, the higher the um, angular momentum about the z-axis and vice versa. So suppose that the 
web length, lambda can take any value. The wave function is going to depend on the azimuth angle, uh, which is phi. So this is a complete revolution gives two pi. So let us take a case where uh, this angle continues to increase for any arbitrary value of lambda. And that gives a different wave function after each uh, rotation is completed. And this is unacceptable uh, in quantum mechanics. What we expect is that the particle should reproduce its wave function after each successive rotation. So an acceptable wave function um, is obtained if the wave function reproduces itself upon each um, complete cycle. Now, because only some wave functions exhibit this property, only some angular momenta are acceptable, and because only certain rotational energies exist, indicates that rotational energies are also highest. So if we take the wavelength to be equal to the circumference uh, divided by the magnetic quantum number, then the allowed values of the angular momentum uh, will be obtained by substituting lambda into this expression. And that gives this, which translates to this, and which gives this. I mean, h all over 2 pi gives h bar, where this represents the values of the magnetic quantum norm. Therefore, angular momentum is limited to the values of the magnetic quantum number. Positive values of the magnetic quantum number correspond to clockwise rotation around the z-axis, while negative values uh, correspond to rotation in the counterclockwise direction. So, if we substitute the value of j, uh, j sub z, uh, which is this, uh, here we obtain this as the energy of rotation. And this energy depends on the square of the magnetic quantum norm. So, what is the wave function of rotation? Uh, let us take uh, this to represent the case where um, the particle is restricted on a cylinder. Uh, this is cylinder. We make the ring a bit thicker so that we see what is going on. So this is the position of the particle um, on the wall of the cylinder, the ring so to say, and this is the length of the position from the vertical axis and this is x direction that is y direction and that is z direction this is the azimuth or angle x is equal to this while y is equal to that we use z r and phi to discuss the axial symmetry of cylindrical systems in quantum mechanics uh, so if the particle is confined to the um, x, y plane, only r and phi can change. Therefore, the Hamiltonian for the particle, um, um, which has mass m and um, the potential energy zero, is given by this. And we can write this, this is written in terms of Cartesian coordinates. And we can write this in terms of the cylindrical coordinates as in equation 43. So the derivative with respect to R will be discarded because R does not change. Um, because the particle is held fixed on the wall of the cylinder and R is fixed wherever the particle moves to on the surface of the cylinder. So the Hamiltonian can be written 
as this. That is, we ignore this, we ignore that, and we say this is now equal to this, and we substitute this there, given this. So we can write the Hamiltonian um, now as in terms of the moment of inertia as in equation 45. So the Schrodinger equation is therefore um, given in equation 46. The next question is what is the wave function that will satisfy equation 46? Um, mathematics tells us that the acceptable wave function will have this form where m is the magnetic uh, quantum number and it bears this expression. So one of the principles of quantum mechanics is, is that uh, the wave function must be single valued. That is, um, in this case for rotation, the wave function shouldn't change uh, for each rotation. That is, for each rotation, the wave function should replicate itself. So this gives this, if we substitute um, and this into um, this position and that, that gives this as the corresponding wave function. We use laws of indices to expand this and that gives this. And this expression uh, divided by um, square root of two pi gives the wave function, that is this. And we can write that the wave function is this times this expression. Now, because exponential i pi is equal to negative 1, then equation 48, which is uh, this, is equivalent to this. And because this needs to be 1, uh, this one needs to be 1, it means this must be a positive or a negative even number, and that includes zero as well. Therefore, the values of m must be zero, um, plus or negative one, plus or negative uh, two. If we take the probability density of the wave function, that is this, it gives this, and it gives this as the final value. That says that the location of the particle is completely independent of the angular momentum. And in other words, knowing the position of the particle excludes the possibility of knowing the angular momentum, and knowing the angular momentum that removes the possibility of knowing the position of the particle. Rotation in three dimension, that is rotation on a sphere. In this case, we use spherical polar coordinates. And the, because the particle is confined on the surfaces of the sphere, only the polar attitude, which is theta, and the azimuth, which is phi, will change. We write the Schrodinger equation as an equation 51. This is the uh, this bit represents the Hamiltonian operator, that's the wave function, and that's the corresponding energy. Um, v is zero, that's the potential energy because R does not change. And the S squared is equal to this. Uh, we use uh, the Cartesian plane, which gives this in three dimensions. Now, we can write the wave function in terms of uh, theta and phi, uh, since r is not changing. So the differential equation in the Schrodinger equation uh, can be simplified into um, the wave function, uh, which is a function of theta and phi by the separation of variable procedure. And that gives this. Uh, for theta and this for phi. That is to say that this is a function of theta and 
this is a function of pi. Now, a solution of the Schrodinger equation uh, shows that the acceptable wave functions are those that are specified by two quantum numbers, the uh, L and M sub L. So L has this value and M sub L has these values. The orbital angular momentum quantum number is non negative, and for each value of L, there is 2L plus 1 permitted values of ML. So the normalized wave function um, has this form, which is um, called the spherical harmonics. And these are values and equations for certain spherical harmonics. For L equal to 0 and ML equal to 0, this is the spherical harmonic. And for L equal to 1 and ML equal to 0, this is the corresponding equation. For plus or minus 1, this is what we have, and so on. The energy of the particle is restricted to the uh, following equation um, um, L um, and L has these values 0, 1, 2, uh, so on. The energy is quantized and independent of the magnetic quantum number. So, because for each value of L, there are 2L plus 1 different wave functions that correspond to ML. We can see that each energy level um, is 2L plus 1 fold generate. The angular momentum um, of rotation in three dimensions um, follows that the magnitude of it is equal to this expression, uh, which um, is magnitude that depends on each valve. The Z component of angular momentum is therefore this, and it has values restricted by the magnetic quantum norm. So space quantization, rotation, is also quantized, and doesn't take arbitrary values. Lastly, vibrational and rotational energies of molecules are non-degenerate, just like what we have for particle in a box of one dimension because their energies depend on only one quantum number. If you find this video helpful, I invite you to subscribe to my YouTube channel, ring the bell so that when new videos are uploaded, you'll be notified, like, comment, and share. Thanks for watching. The PDF version of this lecture is in the video description. If you have any comments or any questions, I encourage you to send them to me using either my university email address or my Google email address. Alternatively, you can leave those in the comment section of this video and I'll do my best to respond. Bye now.